So this session is going to be on the future of Buddhism. Is there going to be a future for Buddhism? Especially in this fast-changing world, it is time for an open and challenging conversation. This panel will explore a variety of issues and challenges that modern Buddhists have to face in a rapidly changing world. How we communicate with one another is also changing. Internet, websites, and social media are very active in propagating Buddhism, as well as unpleasant propaganda. However, we need to be cautious of the impact of such posts circulating in cyberspace, because how do we know which one is true and which one is fake? A Buddhist approach to gender and sexual identity will also be explored, and with a perspective that is appropriate in our times. Mindfulness can afford a space of possibility from which we can respond to any situation in an appropriate, beneficial, and a timely manner. Greed, hatred, delusion, and fear will lead us astray from the path in making the right decisions at times. So this conference will close with this discussion, and we'll have a summary of the outcomes. So to kick it off, we will have Yutadamo Bhikkhu, who will speak on enlightenment in a digital, digital age. Please welcome Yutadamo Bhikkhu. Is he here? <laughs> can, we, can we share with Tony then? Okay. Well, you know, this is really getting uh, into fashion. We're going to change <laughs> the order of the speakers. Uh, and this one is on Buddhism in a Secular Age by Dr. Tony Toniato. Please welcome Tony on back on stage. Thank you, everybody. Uh, yeah, and if you could raise the lights a bit, I really can't see anyone, and it feels strange to talk into a white space. Um, thank you for, for lasting this far. Hopefully, you, you will feel that it's uh, going to be worth your while, but with the two venables we have um, after me, I'm sure it will be. Um, the, the idea of, of my part was to look at the future of Buddhism in terms of uh, psychotherapy and, and mindfulness and so on, and I, I don't feel I can speak on the future of Buddhism at all anyway. I, I, I really don't, can't be a spokesperson for that, but I will make a few comments about what I see going on in the field of mindfulness, mindfulness interventions in our culture, which I'm worried about. And I'm speaking from the point of view of myself as a psychologist, as a, a psychoanalyst, as a psychotherapist, and for a long time, uh, a, a Vajrayana Buddhist in the tantric tradition. And so my comments are going to be informed by my experiences of the last 30, 35 years. Um, and my focus is not going to be on those of you who practice Buddhism as, as a spiritual path, those of you who are, uh, have teachers that you are studying with. I'm really focused on the tremendous interest in mindfulness-based interventions, the MBSR, MBCT, the short-term interventions that are now the rage in Western culture. And I'm going to be speaking about that and some of the ways that uh, I think uh, that has to move forward in the next generation of, of interventions. And um, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll um, uh, raise your interest. For several decades... Oh, oh and we have a lovely uh, depiction of the Medicine Buddha, the Buddha as healer. For several decades, going back to the 60s, which I recall uh, being from that era, uh, meditation practices have been of great interest in the West. Many of you may remember transcendental meditation and interest in yoga back in the 60s and 50s, in fact, as Westerners have been interested in finding ways to transform themselves with ways that um, were not possible in their, in their indigenous culture. In recent years, of course, med mindfulness meditation, the most well-known aspect of Buddhism, has begun to significantly affect and impact counseling and mental health practices in Western society. Hundreds of studies, maybe a thousand, have investigated mindfulness meditation as a means of enhancing um, well-being, improving, reducing dysphoric emotions, improving quality of life, reducing disability in almost every possible mental and physical disorder. And now, mindfulness-based interventions are offered everywhere, 
in healthcare settings, educational settings, universities, and the public, and so on. Incredible media interest in every journal, every, every magazine, every media outlet is interested in some aspect of meditation. You, don't, you can go off forever. I could, I could spend the rest of my, my talk just showing you covers of mindfulness. <laughs> um, and even this one here is called mindful. And that, that bothers me. That that's called mindful. That's not mindfulness. That's mindful. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Increasing idealization of mindfulness. Meditation. A panacea for every ill. You can find cartoons of this. Live more, love better, worry less, less stress, smile more, learn better, eat better, sleep better, listen better, focus more. Almost everything can be done with just sitting down and watching the breath. And I think that's a very, very major simplification of what mindfulness can do when you take it out of the context in which it has come. When Jean Kabat Zinn introduced very strongly into our culture mindfulness based uh, interventions, he made some modifications to it. In order to make it adaptable and secular, and, and I, it was totally make, made sense, he had to de it in a sense, extract it from its biopsychosocial, cultural, ethical context in order to make it palatable to the West. And the hope was that by doing that and doing it properly, you might get the kind of benefits that are attributed to it by Buddhism and by, by the Buddha, that we might get the same kind of effects. Now, many traditional teachers have really questioned this approach my own teacher, who's, who's passed away several years ago, wondered why that was necessary. Why would you, would, why would you would almost violently take out one piece of the, of, the, of the plan and hope that it would still have the same effect as the whole plan? And so there's a lot, there's a bit of a, 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 um, a schism there between sometimes the, this approach and more traditional approaches. Secular mindfulness, I think, has been essentially psychologized. And mainly reduced to a technique to regulate attention combined with certain attitudes, um, acceptance, presence, non-judgment. It's presented almost as a solitary, introspective, intersubjective, almost narcissistic activity during which one watches what's going on within the mind with the right attitude. Modern mindfulness meditation is very much in the head. This focus is easily observed in the definitions of secular mindfulness found in the scientific literature. Just a couple here, Zindel Siegel, uh, the capacity to respond to mental events with an attitude of non-judgmental, accepting present moment awareness, dispassionate, non-evaluative, and sustained moment-to-moment -moment awareness of perceptible mental states and processes and so on and so forth. They're all like that. Every person speaks that way. Um, on its own, though, this will not solve all your problems. In fact, this could be even pathological state. As a psychologist, a psychoanalyst, this could be a form of dissociation, a form of psychopathy. It could even be a form of narcissism. By itself, that is not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. The psychologizing, well, yeah, I have a, come on, inner peace, I don't have all day. No, it's kind of, I'm waiting for it. The psychology of mindfulness meditation is not surprising as most research is conducted by mental health researchers, psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, doctors of a variety of type. I think that was a mistake to let us take over mindfulness. It's given a particular flavor to mindfulness that is, not, uh, that is uh, too restrictive. Mindfulness has become a technique, therapy, intervention, or treatment to alleviate physical distress and psychic pain, disability or stress, and increasingly medicalizing it as well. However, the Buddha did not teach mindfulness as a way to directly cure or solve life's problems, but as a space in which we come to know our inherent enlightened nature. But only if it's part of a holistic program of transformation and not as a standalone technique. Buddhism concerns itself with how to maximize states of authentic happiness and bliss, cultivate equanimity, compassion, and love, nature, uh, healthy relationships, nurture healthy relationships, manage our craving desires and aversions, tame our unconscious predispositions, like the Anusaya and the Asava. Uh, to relate to all sentient beings ethically, and to facilitate gnosis, transcendence, and the numinous. And mindfulness is one of the many interacting elements of a way of life that contributes to lasting mental health, emotional growth, and flourishing. But little, little of this is evident by the way mindfulness has been decontextualized and promoted as a somewhat miraculous, almost magical, standalone practice, especially in the way media presents mindfulness. And I wouldn't believe anything you read in the media about mindfulness. They get it all wrong, and I read it very carefully. 
Secular mindfulness programs do not deal with the issue of ethics, healthy, wholesome versus unhealthy, unwholesome behaviors. They do not deal with the issue of wisdom, understanding the mind. Modern mindfulness programs do not emphasize discernment, compassion, and other elements of traditional, but not of secular, mindfulness meditation. I think mindfulness meditation is a relational practice. Without attending to one's whole life context, intrapersonal and interpersonal, as we've been hearing the last few days, the effects of mindfulness may be, may be very suboptimal. The Buddhist teachings on dependent origination make this very clear. Mindfulness per se can be used in a positive, healthy way or in a destructive way, as we're seeing in some applications in North America. It can be used with good or bad intention. Without the proper psychospiritual context, mindfulness may even be harmful. And I personally have seen many people harmed by out-of-context, uh, standalone mindfulness. Where this is blatantly revealed is in the research of mindfulness. I'm going to take you in a, uh, normally I teach a whole course on this. Oh, yeah. Well, here this person looks like he's meditating, but most people meditate to seek inner peace and not revenge. You can see what he's, his mind's about. <laughs> oh, I will kill him. Oh, I will kill him. Later charged with premeditated murder. I'm going to take you on, on a one, maybe hopefully, oh boy, I'm running out of time, uh, a two-minute um, journey through the research. I spent a whole year teaching about this in, 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 uh, at U of T in a course. But a close reading of the research literature, and I spend many, too many hours doing that. Uh, not summaries, not abstracts, not titles of articles, not meta-analyses. Actual read the articles from the beginning to the end, and you're going to find something quite striking. You're going to find that most clinical disorders eating disorders, addictions, trauma, psychosis, impulse disorders are not benefited by simply adding mindfulness meditation. It's not a treatment. Mindfulness benefits tend to be very short-lived and dissipate very quickly during follow-up. People don't practice. Huge dropout from mindfulness studies, at least 25%. And, not, and people don't attend. Average sessions out of eight session program, eight, uh, they'll attend six sessions. Why is that? Why aren't people attending? And um, there's a Obsession with the number eight. All these programs are eight weeks long. I'm not sure where that comes from. I think we should forget about that. We fetishize that into, into this unusual, bizarre uh, way of trying to convey this thing. And it leads to this, this kind of um, misunderstanding of what mindfulness can do for you. And it's also, I, didn't, I don't have it here, but a lot of teachers who teach mindfulness in these studies are terribly unqualified, learning from uh, manuals, learning from um, uh, their supervisors or graduate students, and so on and so forth. Quickly here, this shows schematically improvement of mindfulness after eight weeks. Normally, they don't show you the part in the middle. They show you the beginning and the end. It always looks great. Look at that. High, low on any symptom you want to imagine. A few studies present data by week. And what they show is the results of mindfulness happen in the first two or three weeks. How can that be? You're not even doing any mindfulness in the first two or three weeks. And people are reporting improvements. I think what's going on here is people are using mindfulness as a placebo. The expectation, the hope, the, uh, the confidence in the teachings lead to improvement, but not real mindfulness. I've been practicing for almost 30 years. I don't have these kinds of improvements in my life. How, can it, how is it possible that after two, three weeks, people are feeling less depressed, less anxious, and, and always better? And finally, the biggest issue of the mindfulness research is confusion, even by experts, between mindful and mindfulness. Mindfulness is about how, the nature of the mind, how it works, relating to the world without confusion. Mindful is about how we deal with our internal mental events, thoughts, feelings, and so on. There's a reason why there's a nest at the end of mindful. It's not superfluous. There's a reason why it says mindful nest and not mindful. This confusion is the unfortunate consequence when mindfulness is extracted from its holistic context and understood as a type of standalone technique. Most mindfulness studies, I believe, are trained people in how to be mindful but not mindfulness. Now, you need to be mindful to develop mindfulness, but they're not the same thing. And there's a tremendous confusion in the research area about this, especially with children, in the children's um, area. So what is, I'm going to skip this one just for the sake of purposes, that the, the benefits of mindfulness, if we're going to really, really, really witness it, will be if we recontextualize mindfulness. The Buddha taught that durable mental health must address the multiple levels or functions that comprise our being in the world. This approach is holistic, not reductionistic, neither, pro, uh, neither prescriptive nor moralistic, but based on healthy ethics, and not simply psychological or cognitive. 
It's focused on harmony, balance, relationality, skillful means, discernment, and wisdom. And these teachings, of course, are embodied in the Eightfold Path, which is the Buddha's blueprint for um, genuine happiness. It is a completely complete transform- transformational psychotherapy, if properly practiced. And here you see the common depiction of the eight paths. And I want, you, I want to take you very quickly through these, but in a way that's psychological, nothing to do with Buddhism as a religion or trying to convert anyone, but in, in, in a way that is, will enhance, I believe, our, our desire to improve um, mindful interventions. The path of wisdom, transformation of view. I call that perceptual wisdom, understanding cause and effect. If you don't understand cause and effect, how can you possibly deal with your life? Realizing that all experience is transient, conditioned, and incapable of genuine lasting satisfaction, impermanence, emptiness, and suffering. Transformation of intention or thoughts sometimes. Cognitive wisdom. Treating ourselves and others with kindness, compassion, and empathy, free of envy and hate. To be careful to not let our sense desires harm us. The path of ethics. One of the most important ones. Transformation of speech. Interpersonal wisdom. Monitoring our speech and thought patterns to avoid causing harm uh, to self and other through gossip, hateful, divisive speech. It includes imagery and includes how we speak to ourselves as well because how we speak to ourselves, self-talk, is going to be reflected in how we speak. And you can see on the Internet with the cyber-texting and, and um, uh, cyber-bullying that how much uh, wrong speech is destructive. Transformation of action, behavioral wisdom, not intentionally hurting others, other beings by lying, violence, stealing, sexually losing control over behavior. Transformation of livelihood, societal wisdom, earning a living ethically with minimal damage to other sentient beings and the environment. Transformation of effort, emotional wisdom, coping with negative emotions, anxiety, idealizing projections, uh, hateful, um, idealizing cravings, projection of hatred, depression, and indecision to avoid harming self and other. Transformation of mindfulness, metacognitive wisdom, relating to our mental life without confusion, aversion, or clinging, neither identifying with experience nor avoiding it. And right concentration, I, I prefer the right samadhi that uh, Asian Brahma had mentioned before, biological wisdom, cultivating deep inner stillness, calm, mental clarity, focus, and reducing the arousal of body and, and, and soma that can cause um, tremendous damage. So, to wrap up, Mental health is not possible without a healthy relationship between oneself and the world we live in. And unfortunately, brain research is never going to show that. All neuroscience is about the individual neuroscience, but not about the relational neuroscience, if that makes sense. Emotional health is intersubjective, how we view and treat, behave towards ourselves, and intersubjective, how we view and behave towards others. Damn it, Gloria, here I am meditating and attaining all this inner peace and joy, and you interrupt me just to find out what the hell I want for dinner? <laughs> so what good is it to be meditating that when you're going to be speaking that way to, to somebody? <laughs> Unfortunately, I know too many people who are in that category, and myself sometimes too. Um, without integrating and addressing all the elements of traditional Buddhist spirituality, The impact of secular mindfulness for counseling and psychotherapy will always be very limited. And I think we don't have to apologize for that. We don't have to, you know, it's not about converting people to Buddhism or introducing Buddhism. It's about, it has to do with Buddhism. It's the way the mind works and what makes people happy. It has nothing to do with Buddhism. It was presented through Buddhism, but it's not reduced to Buddhism. The next generation of mindfulness programs, if we go beyond MBSR, MBCT, forget the number eight, do what's necessary. By the way, number eight, many, many studies now are trying to shorten that to six to four, to three, or to do it all in one week, all in two weeks. What's the rush? What, why are people doing that? Why not extend it? 12, 16, 24 sessions. That doesn't occur. The next generation of programs need to skillfully recontextualize mindfulness to reflect the holistic basis of its power and efficacy. The challenge is to respectfully integrate the insights enunciated 25 centuries ago in India to our 21st century, consistent with both the Buddhist message and our modern values and a final depiction of Medicine Buddha. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Well, I thought that was a very critical review of secular mindfulness. Uh, Especially personally, I have 
been uh, Ajahn Brahm's disciple for 17 years and recently been teaching MBSR, uh, recently has been over a year, and I would say some of the results are very positive. Uh, having said that, whenever we learn something, it very much depends on the teacher. Uh, not every monk practices mindfulness either, meditation for that matter, and not every monk inspires. So not every lay teacher is going to inspire either. And even if you are in school as a, science, as a science student, some teachers would just turn you off science, and some teachers would just get you so excited about science. So there's always the personal element into it, including psychotherapists, psychiatrists. So I would say probably 50-50. Let's be more balanced about it. So on the next topic on enlightenment in a digital age, uh, let's invite, and I hope you're here this time, uh, Venerable Yutadamo Piku. <laughs> Please welcome him. I knew where I was the whole time. <laughs> so I've got a new clicker today. So my talk is on the relationship between Buddhism and technology. So in modern Buddhism, there's this sort of uh, debate as to whether Buddhists and in Buddhism we should renounce uh, the world, we should focus on renunciation, or we should engage in terms of trying to apply the Buddhist teaching to society. And I think in modern times this has come to be confused with the idea of whether we should renounce uh, technology and go off and live in the forest, as Buddhists, we should all do that, or whether we should uh, embrace technology and apply the Buddhist teachings and, and figure out how to use technology in a, in a mindful sort of way. Uh, but the, the renunciation engagement debate isn't anything new. Uh, in the time of the Buddha, of course, this was a, a debate as well. There was a monk who asked the Buddha to force the monks to go and live in the forest. The Buddha said no. And the Buddha had his monks go off and, and uh, teach throughout India, so... It's not even something that's confined just to Buddhism in ancient Hinduism or Brahmanism. Uh, they had, they had, seemed to have had this problem as well with people running off to the forest, so they set up this system. I'm not sure how successful it was, but uh, there were these stages of life where you should you know, go through the household life, eventually retire, and go off and live in the forest when you're, when you're too old to work. Now, of course, the Buddha didn't subscribe to this either. The, the idea of waiting until you're old is, is uh, questionable at best. So I would say that um, Buddhism isn't a question of either or in regards to renunciation uh, versus engagement. It's more about renunciation and engagement, or to put it more simply, spirituality and society. So spirituality is the side of Buddhism where we go inside to try to purify our, our minds, and society is where we work out externally to try and purify our relationships with others. I would say Buddhism has... Uh, two side, has both these sides and some people, some Buddhists lean in one direction or the other but the framework is there and, and I would say technology doesn't change this it's not a matter of whether we should or shouldn't use technology, it's about using technology in such a way that it harm, it's in harmony with our spirituality so what I'd like to do and sort of I guess what I was asked to do is talk about some of the ways that I've used technology um, sort of as evidence to show that it is possible and perhaps you agree or disagree, to use technology in a, in a Buddhist sense, in, in a way that harmonizes with your spirituality. So I've got these four categories. These are the four ways that I think uh, we can use, potentially use Buddhism, uh, or use technology to support Buddhism. So the first category is building, and this refers to using technology to create tools that facilitate our study, practice, and teaching of Buddhism. The first example is something called the Digital Pali Reader. I don't know if anyone here has used that. I'm, I'm assuming there are some of you out there who have heard of it. Uh, so the Digital Pali Reader is something that I just... Cre it took me many years to do this, but I realized that you can actually talk to your computer. And so I, what I did, you can teach your computer. And so what I did is I took all of the, the Buddhist teaching, all of these Pali texts, and the original Pali, the commentaries and sub-commentaries as well, and I combined them with a bunch of electronic dictionaries and used a, learned how to do a whole bunch of programming, mixed them up with all this talking to my computer stuff. And, and the product, I don't have pictures, I'm, I'm not that good at this PowerPoint thing, but um, 
the result was as a, re a reader where you click on each word and it deconstructs the word. And if you know anything about poly, it's not a simple task. Uh, and gives you a dictionary definition. It works with compounds. It works with sundi. It's, the point being, it, it uses technology. And anyone who's used it, this is used by scholars around the world now. Anyone who uses it will tell you it, it really improves your ability to actually uh, access the primary texts. Now I've done it. Uh -oh. uh, the second example is Meditation Plus, and this is just um, this is our uh, online meditation app. So there's different apps like this, but ours is a, a web app that you can use on your phone or on the on the computer. And you log in, and you log how how much you're going to do meditation, walking and sitting. And it's a community, so people come together. It, it arose from this question people asked, I live in a place where there are no Buddhist communities, what can I do to get a sense of, of belonging, of having a Sangha? And so we put this together, we created this, this place where people, people could come and really feel like they were practicing in a group. Uh, the third is a Buddha center. Now the Buddha center isn't something that I created or was involved with creating, but I've really been working with them and certainly using it to teach. Uh, the Buddha Center is a non-sectarian Dhamma Center. It's got a huge meditation hall. It's got a deer park. It's got a pagoda. It's got um, mountains and waterfalls. It's even got a Buddhist store where you can buy Buddhist paraphernalia. But the Buddha Center is virtual. It exists only in virtual reality. And that may seem silly, but for the people who go there, if you've asked any of the people who, who subscribe to this, it really is the next best thing for them to get together and, and, and access the Buddhist teaching. Um, I'd really encourage you, before you scoff at it, to, to try it out. And, and I'll talk a little bit more in the next section about it. So the second section is broadcasting. And this is the one-way dissemination of uh, flow of information. The, the most useful for me has been YouTube. And any of you who know who I am know that that's true. I've got about 1,500 YouTube videos up by now. I've got Sir Nepal Alhamdulillah reminded me to let everyone know I've got videos for children, these cartoons that we actually used Second Life to, to create, if you're interested in mindfulness for kids. Um, but YouTube has really allowed me to increase my audience by an order of magnitude. So this is exceptional for me. To give a talk to 400, 500 people is not what I do every day. But uh, when I upload a YouTube video, a thousand people will watch it. I get about 4,000 views a day. I've got 50,000 subscribers, I think. And uh, it, it really just opened up my eyes when I uploaded my first YouTube video so long ago to how powerful uh, technology actually can be for potentially doing good. Nope, no, I'm not doing it. Second Life. Second Life is the platform on which the Buddha Center was created. So it's actually a game and there's a lot of unwholesome things that go on there, but the platform itself is incredible. It's used by NGOs and, and all sorts of organizations because it allows you to create a space like this in virtual reality where anyone can walk in the door. You know, ordinary video conferencing, you have to be invited and you have to have it set up and, uh, and so on. They have a schedule and there are, there are classes going on every day. I was going to try to broadcast this in Second Life, but you know, technology is complicated. Um, but I teach there almost every day, and so every evening people gather together and they're able to sit down and I'm, they hear me over here and I hear them talking back to me as though we're in a room together. It's really quite useful. It's the most useful platform I've found f for actually uh, feeling like you're in a, in a room talking to each other. And the third is Shoutcast. Shoutcast is just an example of an MP3 uh, streaming service. Um, some of you are familiar with it. But the point, the reason why I think this is important to mention is because the thing about technology that I've learned is it really, really stretches the, the saying, a little goes a long way. With technology, a very, very little goes a very, very long way. And so an MP3 file now is, is the minimum standard. And it, it, it's so versatile and, and, and accessible. It's a small file that you put up on the server or you even stream. And, and anyone with a phone, even a 3G connection, can listen to me giving a talk. It's not about the technology. It's about the content. And if the technology allows that, a simple MP3 file, you don't have to go to Second Life or even YouTube. You know. The third category is communicating. And so this is the two-way or the, the many-way, the, the group uh, dynamic uh, flow of information. And the first uh, example is online meditation courses. So on our website, in our web app, there's a schedule. 
and people pick slots and when their slot comes up they can connect with me and this morning I was talking to someone in Mexico and so every day I do video conferencing with people and lead them through online courses. It's not the same as a, a, a intensive meditation course but it's a great start and people who have done that then often come. Recently I had a woman from Romania do an online course with me and uh, she's, she has muscular dystrophy so she rarely leaves her house let alone her country. She finished the online course and decided she was coming to Canada. She just flew all the way, barely being able to walk, to here to Canada, to our center, and spent a month with us. And uh, probably coming back. She's, she's already booking a course to come back. Uh, online Dharma groups. So uh, our organization, these are common, of course. I'm sure many of you know of examples. Bhikkhu Bodhi does, I think, online groups. Uh, our group has just finished studying, we're finishing studying the Visuddhimagga, we're going to move on to the Abhidhamma, but the internet allows for this, for, for people from around the world to come together and, and share the Buddhist teaching. And the third is online organizations. So I have a, I'm the president of a charity, a registered charity here in Canada, and we have a board of directors and volunteers, and yet m many of our volunteers and even some of our board of directors don't live in Canada. Some of them I've never even met. My organization is possible entirely because of the, the internet and because of the online community. You don't have to deal with just the local uh, when you've got this international pool of, of people who are interested in what you do. The fourth category is socializing. Uh, and this one I think is a little contentious. To me it's a little contentious anyway. I put Facebook because it's the only one I really know. I don't use social networks to spread Buddhism. I don't network socially like that. Um, but uh, I, I think the thing about, about Facebook and about, sorry, about socialize, so the social network phenomenon in general is uh, that it has great potential for good and I think it's worth, it's worth exploring and, and remembering and I don't think I have to talk too much about this I think it's something that we do explore as Buddhists and, and so just to, to emphasize that that um, the social Yeah, that's not the end of the slideshow. <laughs> Go back to the first one. It's just a repeat of the first slide. No, this, this slide, yes. So uh, the thing about social networking is, is, and with all technology, it's not whether we use it or not, it's about using it in a way that harmonizes with our spirituality. So there are many things about social networking that does harmonize with spirituality. The like phenomenon, it's, a, it's interesting, you know, if you like something, someone posts something, hey, I, I gave a talk yesterday and, and lots of people came and they really enjoyed it, everyone likes that. That's mudita, that's the appreciation of good deeds. Of course, if you're just liking food or, or, or cat pictures, maybe not so much. Uh, so again, it's, it's about our, our intention and I think especially with social networks. It's important for us to keep this in mind, the harmonizing with... Are we, is, this a social, is this a spiritual thing? When I like something, I make very clear what am I liking and what does it mean that I like that? You know, I don't just like, 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 like everything. You know? uh, so that's all. Um, in conclusion, I think it's uh, something that we maybe don't talk about enough is the fact that Buddhism and Buddhists are scattered across the globe. We're no longer these um, tight-knit local communities. And for better or for worse, I think the internet and technology is an essential tool for creating this cohesion on a global scale and allowing us to organize and to commune and to create a sangha uh, in, in modern times. Um, so I'd encourage everyone, to, I think this is something we should talk about, I think it, you don't have to agree with me, certainly you might think, hey, this guy's off his rocker using technology like that, he should be in the forest, what's he doing with a mobile phone and so on. Um, and that's fine, I, I think there's room for debate and room for a sort of a spectrum, but I thought it would be interesting to, to give some idea of potential ways in which we can use Buddhism and to offer that sort of um, claim or, or, or thesis that with the spread of Buddhism around the world it, it has in, a, in some ways weakened us and if we don't keep up everyone is on the internet if you're not on the internet you're not with the audience I, I mean I think that's an argument that can be made so 
Uh, thank you all for your attention. Uh, I look forward to any questions or, or, or even discussion afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yuta Damo Bhikkhu, for the very interesting exploration on the use of technology in Buddhism. So now we move to a very uh, potentially explosive uh, issue, which is on gender and the other one, sexual identity. Uh, gender, I think it's, no, it's, it's not unique just to Buddhism in terms of the gender inequality that exists, uh, exists in just about every religion. Uh, Hinduism, I don't think there's a single uh, female priest that exists, at least not that I know of, and please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the Catholic Church hasn't opened up to women, and uh, even most churches haven't. And in Islam, people in Saudi are still expecting the women to cover from head to toe. So what about in Buddhism, which is supposed to be all compassionate, encompassing, inclusive, forgiving? So there was uh, a monk uh, once upon a time uh, who supported the ordination of uh, bhikkhuni, which is a full ordination of women, and part of a forest tradition, and their monks meditate six to eight hours a day, you would think that they would be fantastic practitioners who would have eradicated most of their ego, jealousy, greed, um, really living the Noble Eightfold Path. And what happens? Uh, he was expelled for supporting bhikkhuni ordination. So mindfulness or no mindfulness, I question uh, where is the wisdom and compassion. So let's invite Arjun Brahm to deal with this issue. Thank you. Okay, I'll stand this time. And so I stand up for equity wherever I see it, and not just uh, with uh, gender equity and also um, the sexual orientation and also race, race um, equity. Equity is different than equality. You know, to say that everyone is equal you know, is an obvious thing which is uh, false even when it says in the US Constitution we are born equal, you just have to look at how people are born, some with disabilities, some with talents here, talents there. That it, not about equality, it's equity. In other words, that people have uh, fairness in their ability to uh, participate in all levels of society and not to be excluded just because of your gender, your race, uh, your age or other abilities, even your mental health. And so that, that took some courage, but it was such an obvious thing. I know that sometimes people uh, think that uh, I'm a modern Buddhist. That is not uh, true. I am traditional, very traditional. Always go back to the earliest teachings of the Buddha for my guide. And you only have to look in there to see that uh, the Buddha uh, had as one of his missions uh, in society to create the fourfold community. And this was uh, under the, uh, not the Bodhi tree, it was, um, it's getting late now, been working hard all day, under the, I think the goat herds banyan tree? Sorry? Okay, I think it was a banyan tree, where Mara came up, and Mara was this image of delusion, control. I always mention that Mara, in the Buddhist um, cosmology, was the head of the realm which controlled others, the Paranimata Vasawati realm, the control freak in chief of the universe. <laughs> so, I always say that every time you want to control something, every time you know, your will takes over, that's Mara. So anyway, that Mara eventually had to admit that the Buddha was free, that uh, was enlightened, said, very good, okay, I concede, you've beaten me, beaten control, and now just take it easy, chill out. You know, don't go around teaching. Teaching is a pain in the butt. And I know that, and all the other monks know that too. Getting up here teaching is just very, very difficult. Gives you lots of headaches. <laughs> but nevertheless, 
the Buddha said, no, I will not leave samsara, I will not enter complete cessation, parinibbana, until I've established the fourfold community. And please, this one little passion of mine is called parasa, not sangha. Sangha always refers in the text to the monastic community. So when you go to refuge in a Buddha Dhamma and the Sangha, monks and nuns. So anyway, he said the fourfold community of fully uh, ordained monks, fully ordained bhikkhunis, lay people, which is lay men and lay women. And under the uh, the Charpala Shrine, outside of Vaisali, three months before the Parinivana, Mara came again and said to the Buddha, you've achieved your goal. There is a huge community of um, male monks, a huge community of female monks, a huge community of lay men and lay women practicing, attaining, marvelous, keep your promise, now enter Parinibbana. And the Buddha agreed to that. I always love to uh, emphasize that because this was the Buddha's intention from the very beginning of his teaching career, to create equity in the Buddhist religion. We've lost that, unfortunately. But once we understand, number one, it's possible, Number two, it's fulfilling the Buddha's clearly stated intention. Why not? And of course, I was told by my teachers it couldn't happen, that it was not possible. The legal system did not allow it. But being a rebel, you learned Pali, you looked at the teachings, and it is possible. There is no obstacle. And so the next reason, why not? And it's always a case, always somebody else's problem. But eventually you just have to stand up and just do it. And of course, you do this thing. As a monastic, you are not there uh, just to get accolades. And you're not there to become famous. Honestly, all the monks here, please don't go down my path and become famous. I hardly ever get to go to the toilet. I can't enjoy a cup of tea, everybody, unfortunately. And also, please don't write books. <laughs> Put all your books on the internet, then will you to demo. And don't actually publish them, otherwise you'll have to sign them all. <laughs> <laughs> so, so <clears throat> we do that because this is our role. You know, selfless service, what you were saying, and I totally agree with you, that part of our life is to serve selflessly, not worrying or being concerned what other people think of you, willing to sacrifice everything, even friendships or members of a club, membership of a club. It's important to do that. And so it's wonderful now that we do have a beautiful uh, bhikkhunis in Theravada here, we have the bhikkhunis in Mahayana. You got there first. Congratulations. I support that. But unfortunately, still we don't have the bhikkhuni ordination in Vajrayana. Why not? It's about time. Recently, I was in Sri Lanka. Uh, fortunately, I have connections uh, with a breakfast with your prime minister and said, why don't we have bhikkhuni ordination recognized in Sri Lanka? The bhikkhunis are there, but they get no support. And he said, no, it's the, the job of the Mahanayakas. He said, no, it's not, it's your job. Stop passing the buck. <laughs> and fortunately, I can do that. I can say that to your prime minister, you know, because, well, usually the language, I've got the balls. So, I do. so you have to stand up. One of the nice things about being expelled or excommunicated, as I prefer to call it, you're only excommunicated once. Once you're excommunicated, you're free. <laughs> 
so actually free not to be afraid and to stand up you know, for something which is important to you. So it is happening. The nice news is in Cambodia, well done, Theravada bhikkhunis supported, recognized on an equal level with the bhikkhus. And it's happening, what I heard in Vietnam, the, the United Sangha, which is a beautiful thing in Vietnam, the Mahayanas and Theravadas, they work together and they apparently have approved recognition support of bhikkhunis in Theravada. Uh, Thailand, is I'm hoping that will come soon. Why not? And of course, I think Burma will be the last Theravada place. But I think when everybody else is, allows bhikkhunis and there's no argument, Vinaya-wise, that's a monastic law, to stop that, it has to happen. So please, uh, those of you from those traditions or those countries, please stand up uh, for the recognition of bhikkhunis. And one thing here to say, that I know many people from Sri Lanka are here, and many Sinhalese may be listening overseas as well. Please don't just support the fat monks <laughs> when there's thin bhikkhunis around. Just have a look at the temples you support. The monks' temples are well supported. There's plenty of places there. How about supporting the bhikkhuni, which need it? And if you want to know why, in the Dakana Vibhanga Sutta, in the Majjhima Nikaya, the Buddha said, check it out if you wish, the Buddha said that the greatest act of dana, once the Buddha's passed away, is a gift to the bhikkhu and bhikkhuni sangha, together. You cannot surpass that gift. So that is one of the reasons why it's really important, it's historic, it's inspiring. You, I, I'm living in the age when we're restoring one of the four pillars of Buddhism and many of you know that you feel embarrassed to be a Buddhist when there is no equity there. Many people, many as the Westerners, they come to ordain with me and they say, I asked my parents, which was one of our rules, and the first thing their parents said, does your temple offer gender equity. I say, yes, it does. Great, you can ordain. So a lot of times, even the parents, other people, you will not respect Buddhism until there is that equity. I know certainly um, Angie was always, that was one part of Buddhism which really upset her, made her feel she wasn't really welcome, that it wasn't gender equity. Gays, genders, transgenders, they are also welcome. It was like, I'm not, I wasn't gay, I had girlfriends, I didn't understand uh, homosexuality. But I had to meet, understand, and I got one of my best accolades when I was invited and I accepted straight away to the gay and lesbian uh, Mardi Gras breakfast in Australia. Because I was supporting them. And the reason was that I didn't dress up, I didn't go in a float. <laughs> but what I did do was actually say that the reason I was there many years ago, that as senior member of the gay, lesbian, transgender community in Perth came up to me and they, they just said something which I will never forget. They said, religion has been so cruel to us. And they said that with such pain that I will never forget that. And when I hear something like that, you always have to do something about it. That is part of compassion. Not may all beings be happy and well. Buddhists chant very sweetly, but they don't do enough. So if you have that compassion, it has an obligation. It's there, it's in the books, it was the Buddha's mission, you can do it to give equity, non-discrimination, even people with mental illness. I'm very proud to have ordained many people who were gay. I don't know about the lesbians, 
I didn't really ask the nuns. But they make great monks. So sensitive, so wonderful, the people who had a gay lifestyle before. They're not practicing gays now. I was a heterosexual. I don't practice heterosexuality. I'm a celibate. And also people uh, sometimes say, celibacy, you must be a sexual deviant. No, don't discriminate. Celibate rights. <laughs> and just lastly, even uh, someone who is a clinical schizophrenic, he wanted to become a monk. You don't judge. You investigate. See if it's possible. I gave him a chance, and now he's a wonderful monk. I'm so proud. There is a clinical schizophrenic who meditates, a beautiful monk, and I'm inspired by you don't shut people off. You give them opportunities. Give them equity. If they can, great. If it's too difficult, then they may leave. But at least you give everybody a chance. That is how I understand the Buddha's instructions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ajahn Brahm, for that very inspiring final speech. I would have said that if he wasn't supportive of equity for women and lesbians and gay, I don't think I would consider Ajahn Brahm my teacher. At the end of the day, I think we always have to be able to find someone that inspires us to have the courage and to overcome our fear to stand up for what we believe in. And that's important as a Buddhist. Otherwise... Why bother to be a Buddhist? Just be a free thinker. So now we'd like to uh, invite all the uh, speakers who have spoken in the last two days to join us on the stage. And it will be open to all of you to pose your questions uh, to any one of the speakers that have uh, been at this conference. So if you'd like to uh, be able to raise your questions, please uh, come to the center part of the auditorium and to be handed a microphone. So we have two queues forming up already. That's wonderful. And if you just want to come up and say a few words, uh, please do so as well. I mean, this is, after all, the end of the conference. So we'd like to hear from you. But please keep it short. Okay, are we set? So we do have an aging population. Nobody wants to sit on the ground. Which is good. Okay. Right. So we'll just wait for Venerable Vimala Ramsey to be seated and we'll get the ball rolling. So I'd like to, uh, yep, let's have Coleman Fung from Berkeley. Yes, uh, from Berkeley and Austin, Texas as well. Um, I would like to ask, actually, one of the questions asked from the last session. Um, I would like to address that question to Ajahn Brown. Um, let me try to rephrase the question. Um, especially consider Buddhism's tradition in compassion, uh, kindness. How do we reconcile that with the traditional capitalistic society that we are in? It's about competition, about winner takes all. How do we make it so that what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, being an entrepreneur, doing running a company, doing all kinds of work, is all about comp competing, killing your competition, moving ahead. How do we live with both worlds? Okay, that you do have the opportunity uh, as a senior well-known monk 
uh, just a couple of days ago in Google uh, headquarters, in no, Google in Manhattan, I talked in Google uh, Mountain View, and also in Facebook. Even though I'm not on Facebook, I went into Facebook, <laughs> the headquarters. And you also go and do really cool things like give the keynote address of the 2015 World Computer Conference. You do have access to people. And many monks and nuns do have access to people who are world leaders uh, in HR, in all sorts of areas of life. And so there we can have a change. Obviously, that it is with cooperation that a company succeeds, the same as a a cricket team or a football team. You can imagine you know, if uh, a football team, they tackled each other rather than the opposition. They get absolutely nowhere. That is what happens in a company. And one of the ways to do that, monks, nuns, we live outside the box. We think outside the box. One of the suggestions is why don't we start at schools by not competing against our best friend in examinations. Simple things, maybe the end of the year, 70% is your personal score, 30% is average over the class to which you belong, so you're rewarding cooperation, which is real life. Yeah, it's great to be able to have some arguments and debates with the monks which you love and care for and with psychologists, which I really respect and got to know, but... We also cooperate. We're sitting here together, learning from one another. That is what Buddhism should always be. That's what our world should be. Not competitive, but cooperative. So we can show that by example, teach that and change some of the education system. Just because it's been done like that for a long time doesn't mean it should always be like that. So little things like that is a way that we can make a difference. To make America great again, <laughs> we need cooperation. <laughs> Thank you, Ajahn Brahm. Okay. And now over to the side, please. Yeah. Uh, my name is Nihal Vikram Surya. I can call myself a Buddhist from Sri Lanka. Yeah, uh, Ajahn Brahm just mentioned about Buddhist in Sri Lanka. I learned Buddhism in Sri Lanka at Dhamma schools as well as it was one of our subjects at schools from grade 2 to grade 10. And I passed uh, Buddhism at grade 10 with credits and distinctions. So, but uh, the three things really I learned in Sri Lanka at Buddhism and that was resonating in me and I saw that in one of the uh, uh, presentations with uh, Dr. Tonya, Toniado. So the three things are, we call it in Sinhala, Yahapat Vachaneya, that is a good speech. Yahapat Kriyava, that is good action. Action means karma. And also Yahapat Situili, that is a good thinking or good thoughts. So the, my question resonating in me is, actions Really, when you do it, other person can see it. And when you speak, still that is verbally transmitted. So, but I want to have a deeper understanding of how when I send love and kindness to somebody, how that get transmitted or communicated. Because that, I believe, is created in my mind. So how it's getting transmitted in to the other person's mind to change that environment or that person's thinking. Is this question for Tony? I think, uh, I believe he's the best person, otherwise I will just okay. direct it to any audience. I'm probably not the best person to add, answer that, but I can say something about that, in that um, the way we think about somebody, and this is a very important part of psychotherapy and, and counseling, so this is something that all psychotherapists know that we project from our eyes, from our breathing, from our posture, how we feel towards someone. So when, if, we are, if we are expressing in our minds feelings of true caring for others, um, compassion and empathy, anything we've talked about here, that will be visible, unless we're tremendously good actors or faking it, it will be visible in how we, the tone of our voice, the way our gaze, eyes meet, the way I walk, the way I, I hold my body. So others can see that. 
they will be able to see it. Even though you're feeling it inside you as a very internal thing, it is evident to everybody else. In the same way that if you feel the opposite, disgust or hatred or ill will, that will also be manifest in subtle ways that people pick up. Babies, we learn that from the first day we, we are born. We learn from the way our mothers hold us, the way they look into our eyes, the sound of their voice, whether they love us, whether they're, whether they're present to us. So we, we learn, we are connoisseurs of that. We learn that right away. We never learn, lose that skill. We pick up a vibe right away. So, of course, as Buddhists, we, we try to embody that for, internally, and that will be observed by others. Anybody else would like to add to that? Any other views? Thank you. Uh, so that means so if I change the perception of the other person, so that other person will get that feeling. Absolutely. Yeah. But still it's yeah. very hard to see how that gets transmitted. It, it, it's like... In psychology, it's called projective identification. Projective. And it starts from the moment we're born. And we, all of us can do that. We can sense right away from people. And so uh, and it's, it's often unconscious. We can't always say it, but we will know it, that somebody is truly caring for us and feeling for us in a certain way, or the opposite. So it might not even be verbal. You wouldn't not necessarily think about it like that, but you will feel it. That's a sensing, right? It's a sensing. It's a sensing. Yeah. Okay, I got it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jenny. Um, I like to know, you know, this conference has been great. So one of the things we talk about as Buddhists, many people don't consume meats, right, or especially beef and so on because of uh, the way they are slaughtered. I know Ajahn Brahm has a story in one of his books, you know, which helps as well. But my question is, uh, we hear Professor Masaru Imoto, before he passed away, talked about the molecules of water and how it can help us heal and to, you know, have no anger and so on. So if we consume, uh, an, you know, meat or genetically modified foods and animals that, you know, gone through trauma, and uh, slaughtered, or we take milk, and we consume that. I, are we not taking some of these into our bodies? Is there a way through Buddhism or okay. the scientific world that we can heal this food before we take it so that we don't get sick or go through transitions and so on? Thank you for the question. Shall we have our, uh, Aya Madanandi take this one? We have to be equitable, right? I very much appreciate your question, and we get asked this a lot. Um, the Buddha never prescribed vegetarianism, and there was a schism as a result. And so we have to be careful, because what is really important is not so much what comes into our mouths, but what goes out. Thank you. Would anyone like, else like to comment? Uh, the four monks there, you're sitting on the mics, by the way. <laughs> the mic's been absorbed. I'm sorry that at the beginning I did not catch the question. And, uh, Is it harmful to eat animals because yeah. they have a certain we level of fear a, and that may we cause some... In, here. Uh, we, in our recipe, we don't take any meat or kind of thing. We are usually with vegetarian. But there was one Greek monk. He went to Colombo. When, when he was in Colombo, there was one person came, presented a petition telling not to kill animals. He says, no, I am not going to commit it. You continue. You know, he says, when you are eating meat at that time, when the killing time, animal is fully blood boiled, so therefore when you are eating, you eat the same hatred. The adrenaline. So ask the person to go in front of the monastery and told, there's a coconut tree. Yes. Is, is there any killers us in the coconut tree? No. So coconut tree make toddy, toddy make arak. After taking arak, you become defiled. Is it due to the coconut tree? So then he told, 
I can't have you. That is the way. Not the kilesas in the meat, but it, even within you, whether you eat meat or vegetarian or whether you take alcohol, whatever may be, we say your kilesas is happening, so therefore I am not going to contribute it. So therefore, as the sister mentioned, the Jesus Christ, he mentioned, take care about what you give out of the mouth rather than what you take in. So that is the point where when we, when we are talking in this kind of thing, may, may, most of the time they are talking very, very strong, very worked up mind, so they are talking very harsh words. So instead, take care about what is going out of the mind rather than take into the mind, take in from the mind, mouth. Sorry, I didn't mean to grab that from you. Thank you. Uh, just very brief. I was just going, if you're, if you're interested in Theravada Buddhism, there's a sutta called the Avaganda Sutta, Amaganda? Amaganda. Amaganda Sutta. That's really definitely worth reading, and I think it in many ways answers the question. Thank you very much. Thank okay, you. so we'll uh, move on to the next question on, and on the other side as well. So we'll have to make it really brief, please, because we've got seven minutes and okay. two people lined up. Oh so, my gosh, there's more in the back. <laughs> Uh, my name's Mary, and I presented at the Mindful Society on community-engaged mindfulness. And one of the questions that came up was, um, how would you, well, one of the questions that came up was about cultural appropriation in mindfulness and secular mindfulness. So this question is to Tony Tonieto, um, who was my professor. <laughs> but how would you respond to the criticism of Western or secular mindfulness being cultural appropriation. Did you do all my course? So the question is, is secular mindfulness... Okay, it's on now. That secular mindfulness is cultural appropriation. How do you respond to that criticism? Because that's that, what's that it up. is. Yeah, that it is. Well, actually, it isn't because it's adaptation. It's completely debuddified. So it's, it's actually the opposite of cultural appropriation. It's you're removing the Buddhism in a sense. You're leaving a cognitive strategy. So I don't get that question truly. It's it's a question that came up from one yeah. of the audience members. Is that yeah, they see sure. that um, that the the process of actually taking it taking the mindfulness skills out of Buddhism so, is a form of cultural appropriation. Yeah. So, you're, so according to that, they mean that only the, pers- the only people who could practice Buddhism would be people who were Buddhists in Buddhist countries. Before the, even, but not even those who became Buddhists later, only in where Buddhism originated. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, th- those kind of statements befuddle me. I'm not sure what the idea behind that is. The teachings of the Buddha are, are not Buddhism. It is the way the mind works. It is the way we function as human beings. It has nothing to do with Buddhism. In fact, even if the Buddha never existed, we would have these teachings. It is the nature of the mind. So that question is very... You've answered it. This, this, yeah, yeah. Weird. <laughs> I want to answer it again. I like the answer. I want to do it again. <laughs> So, so it's best to quit when you're ahead. <laughs> okay, one, one over here. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm uh, Carol. I'm a social worker and uh, also a traveler. I've been uh, uh, in quite a few South Asian countries, or Southeast Asian, I should say. Um, one of the things that I wanted to say is I grew up Christian. Uh, I grew up in a very Christian background, a uh, very strict Christian background. Uh, and so certainly my interest in Buddhism hasn't been... Uh, has been very much um, embraced by my mother, but not by many of my other family members. Uh, And one of the reasons why I left Christianity was because of the uh, gender inequality. Um, And one of the things that when I first traveled to Thailand and I met uh, Bhante Tri over there, um, and he introduced me to Buddhism, he explained it in a very uh, equitable way. Um, And so I was very attracted to it. Um, But then as I got to know the same problems exist in, in the Buddhist society as exist in the Christian society. So my question is, what is being done now? I know uh, Ajahn Brahm has done a lot in terms of, of trying to uh, improve the uh, opportunities for bhikkhunis in the West, 
But what's being done in southeastern, South Asian countries? Do you have any particular speaker you'd like to direct this question um, to? Well, I guess the ones that <laughs> have the ones that are... haven't uh, promoted bikuni ordination yet. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that could be one way of putting it. <laughs> so please confess up. <laughs> be brave. You've got to have the B A L L S. Come on. <laughs> It'd be one interesting of you. <laughs> to hear from the nun also. I think in the, according to the present situation, the Sri Lanka is the best place for the moment for the highly ordained nuns. But I am representing a complete traditional uh, Theravada monastic situation. We have a meditation center. We can accommodate 100 people at a time. We give the retreat completely free. So when the nuns, when accommodated, some of them are fully ordained nuns, others are 10 precept holders. So we accommodate them, we say, we maintain that our monastic rules are there, in the center it's a different rules, among yourself, whatever the uh, bhikkhuni and samaneri and the uh, precept holders, we don't care, we give the uh, monastic treatments and keep this monastic separate and the meditation center separate, so far we are nicely happening. So I am on principles, I am not accepting because I am representing this uh, traditional center. But I don't find any difficulty in the way, way of we are working towards the mindfulness. They can come, they can meditate, and you can do. Now I am thinking about having some nunneries and uh, to go forward, so still I am learning and therefore, for my general understanding, for the moment, for the bhikkhunis, Sri Lanka is the best place for the moment, when compared to the Thailand and Sri Lanka, uh, Burma. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> this is like one of those games where you pass something and, you know, the music stops. <laughs> well, I don't have so much to say about this because just today uh, as we were having lunch I said to Aya uh, Medha Nandi I'm a pro bhikkhuni ordination monk uh, this is uh, because as Ajahn Brahm explained if we have the uh, Vinaya eh, and if we have the teachings and if we have the fully ordained monks, and if the bhikkhuni order uh, had been transferred to Mahana Buddhist tradition uh, from the Theravada, and why can we bring those uh, fully ordained Mahana bhikkhunis in the presence of the fully ordained Theravada bhikkhus and then reestablish the bhikkhuni order? And I, I have been uh, talking about this for many years, and even uh, when uh, West people come to my classes, and one of the very first questions that I, I get asked, by, especially by the women, so then you know, I give this answer. So again, uh, when are we going to reestablish it? We don't know. Maybe before Ajahn Brahm says goodbye to us, we need to establish this, otherwise we won't have a monk like you. It's already established. Yes. It needs recognition. Okay. <laughs> okay, so Venerable Saranapala, we would now depend on you to uh, support the ordination of bhikkhunis in Canada. especially before the next global conference that's going to be held where you're going to be speaking again. So we look forward to that. I, yes. I'm just to say that I'm also in full support of the ordination of Bikunis, if that means anything. Um, Sorry, did you say you're supportive? Full or? support. Yeah, um, all right. 
You but, get invited but back that's then. that's not so important. There, what's really important to me personally, and maybe to some of you as well, there was a very famous monk in Burma, the Mingun Jetwan Sayada, who wrote a sub-commentary on the Melinda Panha. And this is like, what, 1950, was it? Or 50s? Mingun Jetwan. Jetwan, as they say. Yeah. Uh, who, 49. So here, you tell the story. <laughs> he was the teacher of Mahasi Sayadaw and uh, when I went there uh, he, he was quite a psychic he could know your heart he certainly knew my heart because when I tried to ordain as a bhikkhuni and he said not possible I said what else can I get he said samaneri 10 precept so I said okay okay and he said for you only if you do it for life. Mm. And I, I trusted him so much, I just fell uh, into a yes um, for that. And that was um, almost 30 years ago. So Sayadaw Pandita, I trusted completely. And when I appeared to him on the verge of taking bhikkhuni ordination, he said um, that, he, he said that I, I didn't have to change my robes um, and I could practice, and privately he was in support, but publicly he could not. And his nuns tried to throw me out of the monastery, and he just ignored them. So, yeah. thank you. Can I? Sure, sure. I d oh, I didn't answer the question, did I? Oh, okay. You did, beautiful. And I just wanted to let you know the very reason for inviting two bhikkhunis this time in this conference. I have been talking to uh, Dr. Pial and Dr. Indi and the whole committee, organizing committee. Uh, I invite Ayya Medanandi, who is a Canadian bhikkhuni, and also the other bhikkhuni from the Mahana tradition, for this very reason, because I'm the monk, I'm a modern monk who loves to have the inclusiveness, include everyone. So in this prestigious conference, I wanted to see uh, two bhikkhunis, and I, I was also uh, trying to find a bhikkhuni from the Vajrahana tradition, uh, but I couldn't find anyone. But at least I was uh, happy with the presence of two bhikkhunis in this conference. Thank you. And I think it's also wonderful that we saw the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis sitting together to eat and the bhikkhunis were not ostracized to one side in other events. So unfortunately, we have uh, time constraint and uh, we have to close the conference uh, by 5 o'clock. So I'm really sorry we can't uh, extend it anymore. But I hope that you will have uh, uh, conversations post the... Uh, the conference. So now I'd like to invite the man who has been instrumental in making this uh, conference happen and having to take on a lot of hardships. Uh, please join me to thank and welcome Dr. P.L. Wapola. Okay, first of all, I want to thank Ajahn Brahm right here. Uh, this was a big mistake uh, when I was at the last conference. He, I was seated next to him, and I asked him, well, where should we have the next conference? <laughs> big mistake. So Ajahn Brahm said, <laughs> he said, why not? Toronto. I can come there. Okay, Let's, now, now we are here, and I think we're done uh, all right. And... Um, and first of all, I want to thank all of you for coming today. I think about 500 people right here. Uh, some of them must have gone uh, now because of the last uh, stage of the conference. But we have over 1,000 people registered uh, online to watch it. And we have lots of good questions coming. Uh, Derek, the wizard of us, behind the scene, uh, asking all those questions. And also, uh, thank you, Bhante Saranapala. And... Um, and also the, all the donors, or the sponsors, uh, without them, uh, we wouldn't have done this. Uh, we, we, we didn't have anything when we started, but 
we did very well at the end. And also a big thank you to Angie. Where is Angie? Okay, yeah, there you are. <laughs> and and Mekala, uh, she's new, but she did a great job. And the organizing committee, you want to come up? You want to come up to the stage? No? Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, and uh, they really worked hard. Uh, and also the volunteers, I mean, they did a great job. All the volunteers, about 25 volunteers we had. And just want to tell one uh, of the organizing company, Nimali, she, I think she uh, went to the Guinness Book of World Records. She, I think, sent 1,500 emails. So, <laughs> so that's a lot of emails. Uh, Auntie Soma and uh, Auntie Soma did a great job decorating everything. Um, and Rajendra is a fantastic graphics. Where's Rajendra? Uh, I can't mention all the names. Uh, Alice, fantastic. Uh, did the timing so precisely? <laughs> Come on up. <laughs> I, I can't see Alice here. Okay, and uh, Shamali, all the registration, uh, registration lead, and Derek, as I said before, the man behind the scene, all the, the, the Wizard of Oz asking all the in online questions, and, and there's a lot, lot of names. I can't uh, tell them all uh, since the lack of time. But, okay, EK, EK and, uh, and uh, Lucky, the managers. I promoted them as managers. I demoted myself as a volunteer. <laughs> Ike, get up, please. <laughs> yeah. Where's Lucky? And, and who else? Uh, I want to single out one person today. That is Martha. Martha, you have to come up, please. Uh, she's the uh, brain behind the, all the organizing, the event planner for us. Uh, she did so much uh, and took the burden off my shoulders. She did everything. And uh, that is a fantastic job. And uh, do you have any cards? No, you don't. Lisa's <laughs> 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 She was just amazing. We could what have come? done any of this without her. She was just amazing. <laughs> and my, uh, finally, uh, my wife, Indy, uh, she took uh, a... <laughs> And uh, she picked up all the slack I left behind, uh, and uh, as usual, you want to come and uh, say a, a few words? No. no. Okay. All right. So, and some people call her the superwoman, right? That's, uh, <laughs> all right. So, I guess uh, that's it for. Uh, thank you for all coming. Have a, a good night and have a safe trip back. Drive safely. And Ajahn Brahm, do you want to do uh, give a few words? Yes. 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 I'm certain. <laughs> I just want to say just one word. Thank you, Dr. Piaf and indeed for taking all the pain. <laughs> the, uh, the next conference, I want to support Sri Lanka because they've been asking for uh, for a while, uh, 2019. But all, it depends on our Ajahn Brahm. Uh, 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 he's, uh, he wants to do it uh, as well, uh, he's willing to do it, Bhante uh, Jiva, and uh, it's in 2019, but the decision is from Ajahn Brahm and Angie, so they'll have to... Uh, make a presentation and the best bid... <laughs> BMICH, we have 1,500 seats, and you can uh, choose the theme, but let's, uh, let's wait and see. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I would say that we will be making announcements uh, very shortly about where 2019 conference is going to be. It could be even in two places because we do have someone requesting it in, uh, in the USA. So that would be really uh, interesting. Actually, specifically uh, Berkeley. So that would be in the Bay Area. So uh, who knows? There might be two. So tune into uh, Bodhiana Singapore Facebook page and also do look at Brahm Center Facebook page and find out what we do at the secular uh, space. And we hope very much to see all of you again. And thank you once again to the wonderful speakers. Let's give them a great round of applause. And thank you to all of you.
Have a wonderful, mindful life.